Okay, hello and welcome to the first in a series of six presentations in the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office's Shut the Door series of presentations on historic barns in Oklahoma. I'm Christina Wyckoff and I'll be monitoring, moderating this evening's presentation. We're very proud to host Dr. Brad Bays for our Shut the Door series, Dr. Bays is a professor in the Geography Department at Oklahoma State University. Through a contract with our office between 2010 and 2014, Dr. Bays traveled the state of Oklahoma investigating historic barns in every county. In this presentation, Dr. Bays will be discussing log barns in Oklahoma. Tonight, as Dr. Bays is speaking, please feel free to post your questions to the Q&A feature of the application on the right-hand side of the screen. Please note that questions will be reviewed by a moderator before they post to the wider audience. Any unanswered questions remaining at the end of the session will be provided to Dr. Bays, and OK Shippo staff will ensure that responses are sent to the email provided at registration. Thank you for attending and please enjoy the evening. All right, thanks, Tiffany. And I can't see anybody, so um, I hope you're there. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I was uh, really uh, excited to hear about the SHPO doing this and um, we're gonna have half a dozen of these over the course of the year. And uh, I look forward to those enormously. So. Um, the first one, the first presentation is on log barns and log uh, buildings are perhaps a lot more common than you might think in the state of Oklahoma. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about this survey that we did. And the survey was the was the idea of our, our former deputy uh, state historic preservation officer, Melvina Hosh. I hope she's in the audience. Uh, Melvina was the one who uh, thought about this and, and made it happen. And, uh, and I was, I'm extraordinarily thankful for this because it's absolutely the, um, the most interesting field work I've ever done. I'm going to try to uh, cram in some, uh, some learning today, but uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with um, log, uh, sort of the history or historical geography of log construction in the world. And uh, this is a something that's a, it's a topic that is near and dear to geography and actually has a long tradition of study in geography, beginning with a, um, a scholar, well, several scholars. Uh, one was named Fred Niffen at, at LSU. Um, you had a lot of students who went off and did this and examined uh, the landscape. Uh, others include uh, Henry Glassy, um, and perhaps the, the, the one uh, scholar who uh, uh, has probably been the most influential uh, is uh, the late uh, Dr. Terry G. Jordan Bischoff at the University of Texas, Austin. I was first exposed to uh, this uh, at the University of Tennessee uh, Knoxville and with a professor that I had who actually was uh, a student of Fred Niffen's uh, by the name of John Reeder, and he's uh, recently, sort of recently passed. Uh, so I owe a lot of my interest in this to Dr. Reeder. If you want to know a little bit about where uh, log construction began, it's assumed to be uh, a European, North European uh, trade. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jordan was instrumental in um, settling, pretty much settling a dispute between um, Henry Glassy and others uh, about the origin of log construction. And uh, what Jordan and, and others have, have verified is that log construction began in almost every facet, nearly every facet of American log buildings can be traced back to Scandinavia, in particular to Sweden, and especially to ethnic Finns living in Sweden uh, in the 17th century, way back before that. And um, 
to understand that a little bit better, we have to, I'm gonna jump forward to show you a map. And this is an old map, of course, of believe it or not, the Swedish empire, if you're not familiar with, with that. Um, Sweden controlled the Baltic states for a while. And, and part, of the, part of their expansion was into Finland, present day Finland. Uh, and they, they conquered areas uh, of what is today Russia. Um, so <laughs> that's ironic, isn't it? Okay, so uh, anyway, the, the, the Swedes uh, uh, are, are invading uh, Russia. And the, um, the area that you see right here um, is a, an area known as uh, Russian Karelia. And uh, Dr. Jordan, generally, Jordan and, and another scholar by the name of Matty Copps in the 1980s, um, traced a lot of the log building uh, traditions back to this area uh, and, and gives the credit to early log construction to these forest dwelling uh, Savo Karelian Finns who were conquered by the Swedes, brought to Sweden. And so the Finns were the actually, actually the, um, the original uh, people who brought log construction to the new world, to America. That uh, there are two really areas of Corellia. There's the Finnish Corellia right here and the larger Russian Corellia here. And those people were brought uh, into Sweden and the Swedes, because they were an empire at the time, happened to have uh, tagged along with the Dutch uh, who had established a colony at what we today call New York. Uh, the Dutch colonized the Hudson Valley and the Swedes came in to the south and colonized the Delaware Valley. The Delaware, uh, Delaware Bay and the Delaware River um, are located uh, here between Delaware and New Jersey today. And the Swedes, uh, colonized a zone that makes up um, uh, southern New Jersey uh, and a small strip of southeastern Pennsylvania and northern Delaware. And this um, area around Philadelphia now. So this is basically Philadelphia. And um, they weren't there very long. They were there from about 1638. That's when they arrived. And these are the Swedes bringing, the Swedes couldn't get colonists to go, kind of like the Dutch. They couldn't find colonists to go to the New World. So they took prisoners of war and people who were not ethnic Swedes, they, they took the Finns. And so I'm going to back up here. The Finns arrived 1638. They introduced log construction. They, you know, they see the, uh, the continent as having all kinds of resources that they're used to using. And so they were essentially uh, ready to go, uh, ready to hit the ground running when they got to the new world. Later, um, again, th these were, we're talking about um, on the order of a few hundred people. So you have to surmise that this, this small population actually conveyed the um, information to others around them, primarily, the Dutch and later the English who took over in the mid 1650s. Now, once the English took over um, and had control of essentially all of the Eastern seaboard, um, the, there was a, a wave of German settlers who came from mostly Southwestern Germany and Northern Switzerland, Switzerland, the Germanic speaking parts of Central Europe. There, migration stream lasted for about 40 years between 1710 and 1750s. Um, it kind of cut off at the, um, the beginning of the Seven Years' War. So the, um, it's assumed that Germanic uh, settlers were, were used to using uh, log construction. They found it already there uh, in the New World. So they probably added a few cultural traits to the repertoire of log construction practices. 
the uh, both the the Germans and later the um, the Scotch Irish had very large immigration streams into southeastern Pennsylvania, primarily at Philadelphia. But from Philadelphia, uh, they they migrated inland, and the natural uh, curvature of the terrain is to head not west but southwest along the Great Valley of the Ridge and Valley province of Appalachia. This is a, a set of ridges and valleys between the highest part of the Appalachians and the Appalachian plateaus to the west. The Appalachian plateaus are incredibly difficult terrain. Um, migration streams basically follow the valley southward. And at that time, both Scotch Irish, English, Germans, as well as Native Americans uh, had been interacting in this area. Most of the upland southern culture that we understand today uh, that we have in Oklahoma originated in a zone somewhere between southeastern Pennsylvania and eastern Tennessee, probably in present day West Virginia, where the Scotch, Irish, English and Germans and Native Americans um, uh, shared information, intermarried and became known as a different ethnic group. The, the actual uh, immigration stream from Southeast Pennsylvania took place between about 1680 and 1780. By 1780, and even a little bit before, um, uh, settlers had made it all the way to the Great Valley of Tennessee. Uh, so there you have um, mixing up with the Cherokees who occupied the Great Valley um, in southwestern Virginia. Um, they began to pick up Anglo-American uh, culture and economy, language, and uh, in particular, uh, they took on things like log construction. From there, log construction spread to uh, the Muscogee Creeks and eventually to other uh, Muscogean speaking people, such as the Choctaw, Choctaws and Chickasaws and Seminoles. Eventually, we know that um, those folks were forcibly removed from their homelands in the Southeast uh, to what would become known as Indian Territory. That began actually in maybe even earlier, 1818, uh, basically the 1820s to about the 1840s, uh, the, with the, the majority of them being um, forcibly removed in the 1830s, Seminoles coming later in the 1840s. Uh, but th so what we have there is uh, log construction techniques eventually getting established in Indian Territory prior to the Civil War. And there's no doubt that uh, these uh, log building traits were, were in uh, eastern and southern Oklahoma by that time. So I'm going to zip past all this stuff that we've already looked at. And if you look at this um, terrain map, uh, here we have the Delaware, um, Delaware Bay, Delaware River Valley right here. This is the entry point for the Swedes. It's also the entry point essentially to uh, uh, Swedes and Finns for the Scotch-Irish and the Germans, all of whom eventually spread inland and then were guided down the Great Valley, um, as you see right through here. And the Great Valley extends all the way down in to about Birmingham, Alabama. And as they colonized that area, here's where they they ran into the Cherokees first, and then the Creeks, and then later on the Choctaws and Chickasaws. A little better map of that area. The Ridge and Valley is the strip that runs right through there all the way up to Baltimore and eventually to Philadelphia. The zone of the emergence of the Upland South, I think, is somewhere about here, uh, somewhere in, in Western Virginia, um, Eastern Kentucky, but this is where a lot of those traits probably were experimented with. And the, the zone that I'm showing you here is the, the red part is the, the valley colonized by 1740. Um, then uh, of course, after the revolution expanded a little farther. Geographers, cultural geographers have, um, surmised the boundaries of, uh, the, uh, the Upland South. This is a, 
this is a map by uh, um, a uh, historical geographer at the University of Oklahoma, um, Richard Nostrand, and perhaps he's watching this, I'm not sure, uh, but Dr. Nostrand's textbook uh, contains this map. Uh, I'm, I'm a little more of a, um, I'm a little more liberal with my boundaries. I would argue that those boundaries, if there are such a thing as cultural boundaries, uh, extend a little farther west into most of Oklahoma and a little farther south in the west. Just my opinion. Another famous cultural geographer by the name of uh, Wilbur Zelensky uh, summarized American uh, culture areas uh, with this map. And I only place this on the map because Oklahoma, according to Zelensky, was a special place. We were special in the sense that we were not um, uh, we were not clearly part of any one uh, one culture region of the United States. Um, we have cultural cultural traits of the lowland South, the upland South, and Middle West, um, the Southwest, Texas, and the Mountain West. So in the Great Plains, so Oklahoma is kind of a, a special conundrum. The migration of the five tribes uh, occurred uh, during that uh, 1820s to 1840s period, as I mentioned. I want to make a point that they colonized or they, they resettled in very specific zones rather than spreading all across these areas. Uh, where we are here today and where I am in Stillwater uh, used to be part of the creek, uh, the earliest the creek and Seminole areas, and then the creek nation. They lost that uh, as a war reparation after the Civil War because they were slave owning and they rebelled against the United States. So um, the, the thing is, though, they, there had never been any settlement at all in those areas that were taken away. Most of the settlement were concentrated in river valleys and key areas of, the, of their lands. So here are the Indian territory. This is the Indian territory today, um, all of which are made up of brand new uh, recognized Indian reservations. That's a different story. Um, so eastern and southern Oklahoma are the most uh, humid. This is a rainfall precipitation map. Uh, eastern and southern Oklahoma are the, uh, the wettest parts of the state. So they're also forested. And so this is a map of basically the... Uh, different types of forest in eastern and southern Oklahoma. Um, the two main types are the Ozark, um, basically oak hickory forest, hardwood, definite hardwood forest. But even though it's hardwood, there are some areas of pine timber, and I've seen those primarily on the Illinois River. Farther south, we have an oak pine type forest that's similar to what you would find in uh, the, the piney woods of East Texas. Um, so you have significant stands of pine in this area, significant stands of hardwoods here, and in between we have this transition zone that we call the cross timbers, uh, which is where Stillwater is located. And, and the cross timbers are uh, transitional in the sense that they are, the, the trees go away and the grasslands emerge to the west, and the trees get smaller and smaller as you go west. So the scrub, oak primarily, or oak and, um, and post oak and, and blackjack oak are the primary types of trees in the cross timbers. The cross timbers are not particularly um, great for constructing log buildings, but it can be done. Now, the Indian Territory areas um, are uh, where, where Native peoples concentrated. The Cherokees basically spread throughout this area of their, er of their zone. The creeks went up rivers, mostly in their zones, and that kind of applies for the Choctaws and, and, and Chickasaws. They settled mainly along the, the large rivers. So we expected, I expected to find things that are the really old stuff in those old settlement districts. As far as Oklahoma is concerned, Oklahoma was, um, was settled very late. It was settled after the railroads. It was settled by people who were economically oriented and, and progressive, as they called it. They were 
the last people to want to build log cabins and besides the fact they lived in an area that didn't have as many trees even even than it d does today so uh, settlement of oklahoma territory was instantaneous um, in spurts at least and um, i think we have a lot of different reasons why we wouldn't expect to see uh, log log construction to any any extent except for maybe the most earliest pioneer um, examples. So I'm going to move on here. And, and this is basically the Indian Territory versus the Oklahoma Territory. And the counties where I actually located um, log buildings, and I'll, I could talk about this later if you really want to know how, how we did that. Um, I'm going to zip through here. This is these are the counties that where log buildings were identified and recorded, and so if you want to know those counties, the farthest uh, west, well, I guess farthest, the closest to me is uh, Lincoln County, where there's a uh, some log, there's a log crib barn, single crib barn, uh, down in the southern part near Prague, but most of the most of the examples I'm going to show you here come from the Ozark portion, where the Cherokees uh, are today, and that's where we find some interesting patterns and um, dispersed throughout here. But I would say the 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 area that is um, most robust in terms of um, log construction is this zone that today is essentially the Choctaw Nation, maybe part of the Chickasaw Nation. But the Choctaw country, McCurtain County, Pushmatawhawk County, LaFleur County, um, Latimer, Haskell, Choctaw, uh, Atoka, Cole, um, are the, the places where you should expect to find log buildings. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about theory. Um, Students of log construction uh, report that outbuildings will never be constructed in the same degree in care as log houses. So in other words, after trying to understand what people have written about log construction, I tried my best to not get my hopes up. And basically uh, the theory was telling me not to expect to find high degrees of craft craftsmanship in log barns. And that's basically what happened. Um, the reasons for that, include we're on the western periphery of the upland south so we're on the areas where people gave up on using log construction uh, for various reasons um, we're also in an area where um, it was the the settlement was actually very late um, in terms of you know, the sources and the the numbers of people um, indian territory was certainly settled um, um, by native peoples um, who practiced log construction as early as the 1820s. And there are a couple of examples built in the 1820s, but the populations were not large enough to really um, expect large, popular, large numbers of log buildings. Most of the population of Indian territory came in a, in the form of Anglo-Americans who were uh, who arrived after the first railroad crossed through in 1872, the, the uh, Missouri, Kansas, Texas, or the Katy Railroad. Um, and that was the only railroad for a while until 1881. And then after the 1880s is when we see a lot of railroad construction all the way into the 1920s. And that's when you have, beginning really in the 1880s, is when you have the a massive influx of non-native people into Indian territory. Often you know, at the request or the invitation of native um, native folks uh, to work and and to uh, to farm. So my my assumption here is that most of the things you'll see were probably brought in by uh, upland southerners who became what part of the so-called intruder class. Even though they weren't there legally, uh, they were most often invited uh, to to farm and work. Uh, for Native uh, Native American, um, not landowners, but uh, people who control land in the Indian Territory. And um, so the, 
the reason, another issue is, is that we have this pretty wild influx of source, sources from different parts of the country, but I won't get into that too much. Okay, now we have uh, the notch types. So we have, um, to understand uh, log construction, you need to know a little bit about um, notching and uh, how how timbers are shaped and perhaps a few other things, but we'll just keep it to notches tonight. We don't have a lot of time. The most common, uh, and, and by the way, uh, the notch is really a, the key to uh, this, a successful log building. Reason for that is the, the logs, the log notches um, anchor in place the log so they don't move laterally. They also carry the almost in the entire weight of the building. So um, they're also the weakest point of a log building. So the important thing is that you have a notch that does not collect water. Water is the enemy of log buildings, as we'll see. Now, the most common type of notch, or at least the notch uh, that was introduced by the Scandinavians, by the, the Salvo Corellian Finns at the Delaware Valley, were probably the most primitive of all because they used pine logs back in Northern Europe. Um, and, and those pine logs are fairly easily um, put together with um, saddle notches. Um, a saddle notch is the closest thing, almost the closest thing to a, to a Lincoln log that everybody's fairly familiar with. A Lincoln log is actually something called a double notch. Lincoln, the Lincoln log notch is actually called a double notch, and those are considered to be non-existent in the United States or in, in America. Uh, they're actually found in uh, Central Europe in the German-speaking areas of Central Europe. I think I found one though. All right, the other, the, the most common notch that we would expect in Oklahoma, um, or at least I found, was the V notch, and that has a Scandinavian source. But most of the V notches that I found were unhewn. That is the, the logs were not shaped so they have a round base and here's a v notch but this is one with the logs hewn as uh, in the way that you would see it uh, in um, in the eastern united states or in europe uh, logs left in the round uh, were more common uh, beyond the appalachians the uh, other one the, the one that is the most difficult notch is the full dovetail notch and that's the the kind that is exactly like what you see on the corners of uh, your your drawer and your uh, in your uh, chest of drawers, and those dovetail notches are very difficult to to um, accomplish, very difficult to uh, pull off, and the um, the the general feeling is that Americans came up with a our one contribution really came up with a new way to do this, and that was something called a half dovetail notch. In other words, it's less work, but basically does the very same thing. So here's your dovetail notch. I don't have, uh, well, here's a, you know, here's a half dovetail notch here. The only difference is that while both ends are flared on the full dovetail notch, uh, only one end is flared on the half dovetail notch. It's still a difficult notch, um, but not necessarily as much work as this one. Uh, I didn't find many of these, so uh, I didn't find many. Um, I, I only, I think, believe, I believe I only found one or two full dovetail notches in all all of Oklahoma. That's to be expected. Um, it's actually incredible that I found one. Half dovetail notches are are the most common ones in the in the southern states, the southern part of Appalachia, Tennessee, um, and, and and elsewhere. Uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line. So this is the type that you would find in, in Tennessee. Um, I expected to find more in Oklahoma, but I didn't. I found far more V-notches. And I'm not going to get into why that might be. Um, another one is something called a, um, a square, of, well, a diamond notch. You don't find those anywhere except the coastal part of the Carolina. Um, the square notch is not even a notch at all. It's just a um, a way of stacking uh, timbers together. And a half notch is just a, um, it, it's, it's half of a um, square notch. I'll show you some examples. Uh, we also have something called the semi, and this is like a, an academic term for sure, a semi-lunate or half moon notch. Uh, just call it half moon. It's a shape of half moon. 
and um, it's it is the one that you typically find used with pine. Uh, timber shaping is something that's important. Um, uh, it's uh, something that shapes the log and actually makes the notch rather different. I'll just show you some examples of this. Now, um, in log construction research, the, re the, the term for one uh, rectilinear or square uh, set of four walls made of logs is referred to as a crib. When we're referring to uh, domestic or, or houses, dwellings, um, it's usually referred to as a pen, but basically it's the same thing. So just to keep with orthodoxy here, this is a crib, which totally confuses my students these days because they don't, they don't think of a crib as that. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a few examples of, of um, log notching first, and then we're going to go into some building forms. So this is going to be kind of fast because I've got a few slides. Uh, this would be an example of, um, uh, of saddle notching and not very good saddle notching at that. Um, all, of the, all the slides you'll see are from Oklahoma, by the way, from the survey. Here's an example of what we call over saddle notching, and that's the superior type of a notch because it doesn't include, actually it does, and I guess it does here. Um, so this would be a, a double saddle notch, which is not that great. Um, it, in, this particular one would collect water at this point. Um, oftentimes, though, you'll see a, um, uh, an over saddle, and that drains the water a little bit better. Nevertheless, saddle notches, very, very common, not the greatest to look at, but they do survive quite a bit. You might also notice that it's pretty frequent on agricultural outbuildings made of logs to just leave the bark on the log rather than stripping it off. I bet this, this part was probably just eventually fell off from getting weathered by the rain and stuff. Here is a, a beginnings of a round logged V notch. And we call it a V notch because of the upside down V or sort of a gable look to the top of the knot, or top of the log that is shaped uh, so that it's a V shape and it fits into a groove in the log above it so that the uh, there's no area to collect water on that on that uh, corner here is a v notch that is uh, on logs that have been hewn they have been shaped into uh, with flat sides at least and this produces a, a better look uh, generally uh, a little more civilized looking um, um, barn or but but generally it's uh, it's a folk tradition that you will find coming out of uh, uh, out of the east here's another round round uh, uh, round log v notch with multi -si multi scale or multi size uh, logs um, it's not it's not uncommon to find especially agricultural outbuildings to have more than one type of notch on them because it's Pretty common for uh, uh, people to come along and repair them, or, or you know, not have the same skills that the original builder had. This is a, uh, a view of a um, some notches that are would be classified as semi-lunate because they're made of split pine logs. And I'll show you some more example, better examples of that. Uh, here are some. Um, this is a. Again, round logs, but they are split, and these are pine logs that also are semi-lunate. The semi-lunate uh, notch kind of appears, it, it's, it looks similar to a full dovetail, but it's not. It's more like a half uh, saddle notch. Here we have a um, half dovetail notch with, with hewn timbers. This is a fairly old one, but uh, even though the the half dovetails are not exactly um, um, perfect. Uh, they're 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 demonstrating kind of a, a you know sort of a uh, declining uh, skill level of the of whoever made this. Um, this is one thing that we should kind of expect in uh, out on the western periphery of the upland south. This is my. Um, 
my only example that I claim uh, to call uh, full dovetail notch, and this is a really old building um, located in uh, right, right near the Illinois River uh, near Tahlequah in uh, Cherokee County. And a fantastic example of, of old skill and that most certainly is not around anymore. The, uh, the, the logs have been hewn. You can see the ads marks uh, on, on the logs still. Uh, and another thing that says that uh, log buildings are incredibly, surprisingly durable. Uh, they, they do rot sometimes, but usually that's because of the bad notch. Here's a, an example of what I would call a double notch, although I think this is probably uh, not a true double notch. I think it's just a Lincoln log look. Some more uh, V notches with the ends, the, the crown sawn off to make it, um, to allow the, um, the, the building to have siding. If you saw off the, the crowns, the, the overhanging parts after the, the notch, then you're able to put on uh, a wall and make it look less pioneery. Another half dovetail set. And now we have a square notch. And this is what happens to square notched uh, log buildings, even when they're hewn. This was uh, located up in Adair County in northeastern Oklahoma. Even though they're built with, uh, with oak, um, the, the weakness is in the, in the corner notching that collects water and eventually rots and collapses. Another example. Here are some uh, square notches that are covered up well and not prone to getting wet. So they tended to last. And you'll also notice there is uh, uh, some chinking uh, filling in the interstices uh, between these, these uh, hewn logs. Chinking is the filling in of the spaces, uh, essentially. Usually you find this on houses, not on agricultural outbuildings um, because agricultural outbuildings typically need ventilation. So now we begin a quick survey of some selected log buildings that we'll call barns. First are the single crib barns. A single crib is just one rectangle or square set of logs. In this case, we have saddle notches. Here we have, I think we would probably call this one a V notch. It's hard to tell, um, but oak logs. This is a really old one. Uh, up in Delaware County, I believe. And it utilizes kind of a combination of, of V notches as well as saddle notches. Uh, another agricultural outbuilding, just a corn crib. Uh, I think this was down in Oak Fusky County. Um, another facet of log construction that we study are the doors and, and the batten doors tend not to change very much, interestingly. It's also very common for um, crib barns, log barns, to be covered with uh, a shed. In this case, you might call it a, um, just an extending um, shed to, uh, to store more, more goods. Sometimes that becomes a, a place for you know, a calving uh, stall or something. Another larger, uh, this is a, I, I grouped it in with a single crib, but it's actually a double crib, and you can kind of see the um, the additions placed. There's a, a set of um, a set of rafters right through here, or actually, I guess you'd call them ceiling joists, or uh, and and then you have two other you have a, you have two um, log cribs that are joined together uh, with this central wall. So this is a Fairly odd looking, it kind of resembles what we would call a, a, uh, a Cumberland house in Appalachia. Just some more crib barns, um, used probably as, as a, corn, um, a corn crib where you throw in cob corn and let it dry out before you shell it. Another probably corn crib or it could be a, it could be a, um, a stall uh, for uh, for an animal. More than likely, it's a corn crib. 
sometimes the sometimes these are are chinked. In this case, you've got some chinking, uh, probably because this is used as a storage shed or uh, perhaps a, a tool shed. Uh, maybe sometimes you see a smokehouse, and I'll show you actually a couple smokehouses in a second. Sometimes the uh, the shed is um, um, doesn't have a door. Um, most likely, it's uh, still used as a as a corn crib. Here's that double notch corn crib, um, the Lincoln log corn crib, but it's in a real remote area of southeast Oklahoma. More single crib barns, taking different shapes, different roof styles. It's often the case that you can drive by a log building and never notice it because it's covered up with good old corrugated iron, corrugated sheet iron is um, probably um, one of the reasons why so many log barns still survive. More single crib barns, not in that great of shape. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're not. This is one of the most interesting ones. I'm not sure if we would call this a single crib, but it's very large, made out of pine timber and actually resembles a Western version of, um, of log building that um, I won't get into now. More, um, here's a semi-lunate um, uh, timber, um, pine, pine timber, um, uh, barn and you can see that it's typical uh, to raise these corn cribs up off the ground importantly that's that's good to keep it off off the ground not just to protect the barns um, uh, base but also to uh, attempt to keep uh, the, the vermin out of it uh, a, a big large black rat snake is the farmer's friend in this case more single crib barns taking all sorts of shapes, sometimes with a, a, a separate um, covered shed adjacent to it. And sometimes um, you see the, uh, the sheds or the, the, the single crib barns um, getting reinforced a little bit with, uh, with other timber. This is a good shape. This will just tend to be in good shape. Um, some more single cribs. These are all down in uh, uh, Pushmataha County. That's the same one I showed you earlier. Okay, now, if you have a single crib, um, the addition to it is called a double crib. So I'm gonna show you a few double crib barns um, that are located in Eastern Oklahoma. This one doesn't, it's hard to tell what it is until you go around it. And there you see the two, the two cribs with a central passageway. If this were a dwelling, it would be referred to as a dog trot house. There's a little better shot of it. These are just different, different shots of the same building. V notches on it, pretty ancient looking stuff. notches. Okay, the next building is maybe a little better shape, but different. Um, it it uh, is a little taller. It's uh, the the notching on it is uh, doesn't allow so much space, and you'll see a little bit of chinking on this one, I believe. So uh, V notches, round log V notches. Also, it's on a concrete foundation, so this was uh, probably pretty substantial stuff for back then. Next one is uh, one that the, the owner gave me a tour of, told me a lot about. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is kind of a unique one because it demonstrates what usually occurred with double, um, double log barn or double crib log barns. It probably uh, began as a single crib barn. And I would, I would imagine this crib um, was added to this crib. This was uh, the crib on the right is a, uh, a pine log crib built with semi lunate or built with half logs, split half logs and joined by semi lunate um, corner notching. 
This one is clearly uh, oak and, or at least some kind of hardwood utilizing uh, v notching, round log v notching. And of course, this is a corn crib, but uh, so there's not any chinking going on. But uh, more than likely, the pine was used first. This is this is uh, in uh, Pittsburgh County, I believe. So it's um, you have pine logs, which were not that common, and then an addition of, of very common local hardwoods. Another one right off the road, <laughs> amazing, uh, very tall um, double crib log barn. Something about this one just fascinates me. You can see the shake, the original shake shingles on this with sort of a lathe roof. And then it's been covered up with corrugated sheet iron. It actually has a, a essentially a place to store hay in between uh, the passageway, the breezeway of the, of the log barn. So this is actually uh, really, these are really tall cribs. Another one um, was located completely invisible from, uh, from the road. Uh, the owner showed me this one though. It was uh, another double crib uh, log barn. Looks like primarily with hardwoods. This is a little farther north than the other ones you've seen. And in Seminole County, sometimes you find stuff like this in the boondocks, but underneath it is a double crib log barn. Some V notching, mostly saddle notching. Not in use anymore. Um, here's a, an example of uh, joinery between basically extending uh, the crib um, and, and tying them together uh, in the interior. There's another very, very well kept uh, double crib log barn. The owners told me all about this one. Um, you can't really see it here, but once you get underneath it, you can see the, the pine, half log pine, pine half log uh, timbers that uh, are put together with semi-lunate uh, notching. The owner is trying to restore this. Some of the logs are, are rotten. Of course, pine pine is a lot more susceptible to uh, uh, to bugs and and, and rot uh, than than the hardwoods. But it's a it's a really nice barn. This is uh, oftentimes. Learning about barns, uh, you get lots of information from, from the owners and people want to volunteer lots of stuff. This was the original owner, as I understand it. And then later on in life. Another uh, double crib log barn. I'll just zip through here, in interest of time. Maybe we want to have some questions. Uh, I don't want to get to the, the cool stuff. Um, I already showed you this one. Um, Okay, so double, we have single, we have double, we have uh, tied together double, we have double again, double with a man, with a uh, gambrel roof of all things. This one's pretty much fallen down, really bad shape. Um, and now we have a double crib that's a stacked double crib. So here we have what is essentially the eye house version of a log crib barn. Two cribs um, stacked together, actually too long and too, too tall. This is for some reason one of my favorite um, barns. And you can see again, pine timbers, half um, uh, semi-lunate tied together. And that's that. We'll move on to the log, the four, the, uh, log four crib barns. The log four crib barn is considered to be uh, one of the, the rarest in the United States. Um, Terry Jordan found, I believe, three, maybe four within the entire state of Texas. I didn't think I'd ever find any. Um, and, and, and somehow I did. There were found at least two of them. And this one's not so pretty, but at least it does have four cribs. Now, the interesting thing about a four crib barn is basically you have one, two, three, four cribs and then a very large roof over the top. 
that that huge roof is kind of a, a trick to pull off. Eventually, it's thought that the four crib barn um, was transformed into what we call the transverse crib barn by turning the um, the ridge line of the roof 90 degrees. And by turning it 90 degrees, you could also uh, cover up that space in between one row, between two rows of cribs and have essentially a six crib barn or maybe an eight crib barn. Um, and that, that barn was uh, expandable, but this was the supposedly the, the, uh, the transition, this supposedly notes the transition between the double crib and the transverse crib barn. So they're considered to be very rare and they're, the, the largest number are found in East Tennessee. Double, or four crib barn. Another four crib barn, one that we wound up uh, nominating and, and placing on the National Register of Historic Places, is located way down in Marshall County. And I'll show you that in, right here. It's a huge barn, four cribs, each crib about 11 to 13 uh, feet tall. Uh, with a gargantuan roof, and you can't really appreciate it till you go inside. Each one of those cribs is about 11 feet tall. They're on. Notice that they're on uh, uh, Bodark stumps as foundations. This particular barn was, uh, and it's it's also done with uh, half notches uh, and and square notches, uh, which are not perfect. But this barn was. Uh, actually brought across the Red River in 1895 from Texas. Who knows how old it is, but uh, it is now on the National Register of Historic Places. Log transverse crib barns uh, finalized our, our ex exploration of the log barn landscape. And uh, hopefully I can you remember what I said about the four crib barn. Uh, you essentially create the most common looking barn that people understand uh, today. And that is a, um, a barn with um, three different cribs on either side and a central runway with uh, the runway is parallel with the uh, ridge line of the roof. This one, of course, is done with pine timber and sumo lunate uh, notches. The inside, you'll notice that the, the corn crib has uh, uh, the, the flat side of the, of the logs are facing the interior of the crib so that you can increase the capacity of the corn crib. Batten doors again, real common. Uh, uh, haven't changed since Finland pretty much. This is the, uh, uh, this is another transverse crib barn that, or this is the same transverse crib barn uh, that was also nominated. Interestingly, the only two log transverse crib barns that I was able to find happened to be uh, just a few miles uh, from one another down in this. Is, if you notice this uh, terrain, this is the potato uh, potato hills of um, uh, in Pishpatala County. No, uh, it's McCurtain County. I think I can't remember. All right. Um, yeah, push my tahawk. Yeah, yeah, I put it there. All right. So anyway, the, the Potato Hills uh, are uh, one of those ancient areas where uh, the rivers have cut through. So you have, you know, the the little river is older than the than the mountains. And here's another. Uh, here's the other one. These these two uh, buildings were apparently built in 1909 by the same barn builder. Not in the, not as in a good a shape as the last one I showed you, but that's that. And I want to wind up with this one. Um, a uh, uh, an associate of mine um, uh, who is a dendrochronologist. Uh, he and I are going to attempt uh, to sample, or at least begin sampling, um, the logs within some of these older log crib barns. Uh, if you look inside this one, this is the logs. Um, it's all covered up. You would never notice it from the exterior that it's a log barn, but it is. We're going to try to date uh, these barns and uh, get an idea of when they were built. And, and, and I think this is going to be a really exciting project.
So that's all I have tonight. I'm sorry I didn't go a little faster, but uh, special thanks again to Malvina Heisch, to Linda Ozan, who is was originally going to be our moderator, but has the flu today. And uh, if she's watching, I hope she's feeling better. Um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, the College of Arts and Sciences and the, especially the Department of Geography, my department head at the time of this survey, uh, Dale Lightfoot, and my department head today, Allison Griner. So uh, thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'm, I'll be here. Dr. Bayes, I see some questions in the chat and in the Q&A, so I'm just going to read these to you. Oh, if you can sure. hear me. Okay. I'm just going to read you these questions and um, let you let you respond. Okay. So the first question that I have in the Q&A right now is from Anna Eddings. And the question is, if the log walls of a barn are covered in siding, wood or metal, how would that affect its eligibility for the National Register of Historic Places? Not at all. Yeah, it, it, the, it, well, I mean, the eligibility for the National Register is not necessarily based on being constructed with logs. Uh, the eligibility is based on its uh, represent, representation of, you know, in the case of logs, expert craftsmanship, or perhaps a rare uh, form like the four crib barn or a transverse crib, log transverse crib barn. Um, but primarily, the um, if it's just a single crib barn like the ones that I showed you, probably not eligible at all. Um, at least, I'm not the I'm not the one that determines that necessarily. So uh, don't quote me on that. But I, if if you had something covered up with siding, um, no, it wouldn't really matter at all. I wouldn't think. I can't speak to any of that because I'm the archaeologist here. So we will go with your answer until anybody says otherwise. <laughs> so um, I have another question regarding an email address for future correspondence. If someone in this presentation wanted to reach out to you, is there an email address that they could reach you at? Yeah, uh, you can Google me and I, I, I can't hide from anybody. So um, just Google my name, Brad Bays, um, Oklahoma State University. But my email address is also really easy. It's just bbays at oakstate.edu. That's bbays at okstate.edu. And Chantry Banks asks, um, I know lumber was scarce in western Oklahoma, but are there any log barns west of I-35? Yes, there are, and most of them are uh, recorded by the State Historic Preservation Office already. Some of them are on the National Register. I, I think there's one on National Register in uh, Ellis County, of all places, so it's way out there. Um, in general, uh, the, the other side of this is that the technique that I use to locate um, log buildings, um, I only began that technique after I'd surveyed the western half of the state. So I don't want to say that the western half doesn't contain log buildings. I know it does, not nearly in the concentrations that we find in the east, southeast part of the state. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure there are enough to find out there and um, good luck if you can find them. Diane White asks, how did you find all these barns? Driving around? talking to locals? Um, well, it's actually kind of a long drawn out explanation, but essentially it involved uh, using geographic information systems, um, aerial, pho aerial photography, and very old topographic maps from the US Geological Survey. And uh, that, that, was the, that was the system that I used for central, northeast, and southeast Oklahoma. And it turned out to be wildly wildly successful in terms of finding things in any, any type of barn, not log barns. That's great. Does anyone else have a question? Feel free to enter that and uh, and or if you had a question in just before or uh, just when it's too late, we will make sure to reach out to Dr. Bayes and, and back to you with an answer. Um, and so 
I really appreciate your presentation today, Dr. Bass. Thank you so much for this. And uh, thank you to everyone who's attended. Please mark your calendars for the next presentation in our Shut the Door series, which will be Tuesday, April 26th at 6 p.m. Central Time. And in the next presentation, Dr. Bays will be discussing Three Bay and Crib Barns in Oklahoma. More on, more on Crib Barns coming up. Well, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a, have a great evening.